Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Hyperledger in depth, an hour with Bosch on scaling DLTs with the Parent Lab uh, framework. Uh, this is a discussion that will be hosted by six speakers, so I'll let them introduce themselves as as they go. Um, they all are either with uh, Bosch or with Darmstadt University, so we have both researchers and industry experts today. Um, I'll let you tell you a bit more about the in-depth uh, Hyperledger in-depth series. Um, first of all, like every other meeting in Linux Foundation, it is held under the antitrust policy. You can read the full policy if you click click in the top right corner on the QR code uh, or scan it. Uh, this, in general, antitrust policy means that you shouldn't be sharing anything that isn't public knowledge or could be considered IP during meetings within the Linux Foundation. The, this session is being recorded uh, and will be available on our website as well as our YouTube channel after the presentation or after the session finishes. Uh, and also uh, any slides that presenters are using will be available to download while um, in, in, in parallel to the recording. Now, as Hyperledger in-depth is not a typical Zoom presentation, it is really about being interactive. So please um, participate. We have discussions uh, set uh, scheduled throughout the talk, so there will be time to participate and to engage. Um, if you feel like you know everybody's speaking and you want to just uh, jump in, you can raise your hand, uh, which is a button that you have on your navigation bar. Uh, if you, your mic is not working or you're shy, ask questions in the Q&A. They will be definitely also addressed. And if you want to do some side chats or tech issues or something like that, use the Q&A box. Uh, I will allow everyone to talk so you can just unmute yourself whenever you want. But please, obviously, bear in mind that um, we, we want to kind of keep it um, Polite. Uh, okay, with that, uh, I present you Hyperledger in depth, an hour with Bosch on Parent Labs framework. Um, so I'll let the presenters take over. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Does it work? Can you see the presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, I will arrange it a little bit. Yep. Okay. So looks good on my side as well. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody again. Um, my name is Matthias. I'm working for uh, previously TU Darmstadt. We now founded a company called Polycrip, and I will presenting, uh, be presenting to you together uh, with my colleagues also from Bosch, uh, the parent framework. Uh, the parent framework in its essence is a modular framework for building scalable blockchain applications. So what was our motivation from the research side at Tour Darmstadt for uh, this work? Uh, it's the general observation that popular blockchains that we use widely don't scale very well. So when we look at the mo two most popular in the uh, open space, Bitcoin and Ethereum, then um, we have a transaction throughput limit of about five to 15 transactions per second. We have transaction confirmation times in the order of minutes or potentially hours. And we have transactions costs that vary a lot depending on the load on the blockchain. So on the right-hand side, you can see the graph of the uh, gas price, which is the basis for the Ethereum transaction price. And even if we don't uh, convert it to US dollars, even the inherent gas price uh, varies a lot over time, depending on the load on the Ethereum network. So this really makes these, these blockchain technologies that are used uh, uh, for, for some use cases, but for other use cases, they, this makes uh, them insufficient. So for example, when we think of micropayments, we need usually um, high throughput, low transaction cost, fast confirmation times, the same for high frequency trading. It doesn't work if we have to wait several minutes or hours for our confirmation and any day-to-day -day shopping of goods that are not of um, 
high value uh, isn't feasible with, with these high transaction costs. So this was uh, the main motivation from the research side. And now Daniel from Bosch will uh, tell you about uh, the challenges from the industry side. Yeah, thanks for handing over. Hi, together. My name is Daniel Kunz and I'm working for Bosch Center Research in Germany. I would like to give you an over overview about challenges we see by adopting blockchain technology in IoT space. The first point we see is regarding transaction value and frequency. Having not only a big number of running devices, we also do expect a high number of microtransactions as we want to be able to realize small asset transfer for received services or data or at least parts of them. Next, please. Um, the IoT space consists of several kinds of entities from cloud native instances up to small embedded devices. Looking there at the different domains and constellations like manufacturing or sensors, you cannot assume that every entity has a persistent connection to the internet. This is on one hand resulting from energy optimizations if it runs by battery, for example. On the other hand, it can be located in a local available secured network with no direct internet connection available. Assumption is that local direct interactions are in general possible, but interactions through the internet only either by using so-called gateways or at the defined periodic time slots. Next, please. The last constraint is coming by the device itself. As it is optimized for the dedicated use case and environment it runs in, it will have limited power constraints, for example, the embedded devices and also limited memory available. These constraints will have the outcome to bring only small code sizes with minimal functionality to such devices if they have the need to execute transactions. And next, I would like to hand over to Sebastian. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthias and Daniel, for giving a little uh, motivation on this topic. Uh, my name is Sebastian Stammler. I'm a PhD student at TU Darmstadt and also a co-founder of the university spin-off Polycrypt. Um, I led the development of the um, Perun SDK, which we are going to introduce to you later since 2019. And uh, at this point, we would like to have a little discussion round, and I want to kick it off with um, asking you a couple of questions. So um, in particular, if you experienced any of the following um, scaling issues in your blockchain projects, um, because this is all of the um, problems that we actually address with this framework. Um, so as mentioned already, whether you experience too low transaction throughput, in particular for microtransactions, if you experienced, of course, this is rather relevant for public blockchains, but if you experienced um, a problem with transaction costs, and also, which is um, sometimes very important for some applications, if you sometimes experience that the confirmation took too long, so that the finality of a transaction, even if it is just seconds, that can still be um, a, a big problem in some applications. And this is also something that um, we will uh, can tackle with our um, solutions. So because we basically have instant transaction um, confirmation, but yeah, that's something you can, um, yeah, we will discuss now, hopefully. So we will so, wait a bit um, more for everybody to give the answers. Yep, so. uh, we launched the poll. So please uh, take uh, take part in the poll and uh, that will be the um, start of the discussion. Um, I think, well, I'll, I'll reveal because uh, you can't see the re results. I would like more people to answer, but I would like to say that for now, transaction cost is too high, it's 75%. Confirmation too long is 58%. And throughput uh, too low is 67%. So I think it's quite interesting. What yeah, do you that's think? That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, not that I like people to have problems, but <laughs> but for us, it's uh, I like that uh, people actually really experience those problems. And this is exactly what we are, um, yeah, what we are tackling here. Um, I wonder for those of you who voted, um, how uh, how does the whole kind of 
transaction costs versus throughput versus confirmation. How does it shape how you design your uh, your solutions? I will remind you, you all are able to unmute yourself if you'd like to join the discussion. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. something that I would also be interested because you, I think you said that transaction cost too high was actually at 75. Oh yeah. 77 yeah, even. Wow. Yeah. So does that mean that many of you are also like running uh, projects in a with a public blockchain. Uh, Oliver uh, mentioned in the chat uh, that paying twenty bucks on Uniswap uh, is just not fun to use. So that yeah. would seem. Oliver, would you like to share what what you're doing with blockchain? Because it seems like you are using public uh, ledger, aren't you? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh yeah, fine. Um, yeah, well, I don't have my my uh, my camera activated. Yeah, I'm I'm just using it sometimes for token swaps, and uh, with MetaMask, it already finds the cheapest uh, the cheapest platform to swap the tokens, but it's still way too expensive. Um, yeah, so I hope there's an easier solution which can be used as um, easily with with MetaMask as uh, Uniswap, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, scaling DeFi applications like Uniswap is definitely something that we are also working on right now. Um, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, we are not going to talk about this in the presentation later, but we can surely, if there, if there's other interest in from the audience, we can surely also talk about scaling like current DeFi applications on Ethereum, if there's any more interest. So Sebastian, uh, I, I will ask you a question then, because um, yep. we've discussed the IoT uh, problems. Is uh, this something that uh, you've been working on, kind of, Perun came from uh, working specifically on IoT and what kind of IoT uh, solutions were you building uh, that, that came, brought, brought up those problems? Um, so, Probably some of my colleagues can answer that better because IoT is, of course, just one application of the mm -hmm. technology, but we already have um, proof of concepts running on IoT devices. I don't know, maybe Hendrik or Daniel want to share some of their experience um, doing that. Because we also have, in, in, at TU Darmstadt, we also have um, projects with students where they um, were exactly uh, using the Perun framework for scaling on IoT devices. And um, from my side later, I will also point anyway to another project where we want to include Perun for payments. And this will be then also for machines and organization level. Right. Uh, Greg uh, mentioned that uh, while well, Ethereum is also a part of Hyperledger, in quotes, part of, uh, so, so it comes at a price, but in his opinion, Bitcoin is beyond reach for most right now. Which, yes, it's a good point. We all wish that we were early in, <laughs> early adopters. Um, right, well, I'll let you continue, sorry. Yeah, so should we? Yeah, if there are any more questions at this point to us, um, yeah, please ask, or we will just continue with the presentation otherwise. Yeah, I think we can continue. Yeah, all right. So, okay, so we, we heard about um, the the motivation of the, of the project and, um, how did we actually solve them, uh, th these challenges? Um, at the core of our parent framework is uh, something that is called state channel technology. And the goal here is to offload as much of the transactions and the interaction of the chain, of the blockchain onto a second layer that we call off-chain layer. And we achieve that by um, deploying a smart contract that has some 
asset holding uh, logic in it and some um, some other logic for al allowing this functionality and how that uh, uh, roughly works is uh, when you want to particip participate in the off-chain network you uh, deposit some funds on the smart contract um, and then you can uh, interact without any of the on-chain limitations. So once you de deposited the funds on the contract and you signal um, with whom you want to interact off-chain, you can uh, transact with basically unlimited throughput, which is just limited by the number of signatures that your computer can generate. Uh, so that is more than 1,000 transactions per second. Uh, there's no on-chain transaction cost and you have instant confirmation. So any uh, state that you agree on off-chain with your, uh, with uh, the, the channel participants can be registered on-chain and made a global, made, uh, uh, yeah, be a global state again. Um, so this is really a direct communication and this is also why it achieves instant confirmation times. And our protocols that we developed on the research side are provably secure. And this also has another interesting property. We can even uh, have cross-chain support. So we can open channels between different blockchains and have clients from on different blockchains exchange funds with each other, even though they are not connected to the same network. So this is at the core of our framework. And what we are actually building um, the framework consists of several components. At the core is the state channel SDK, which uh, holds the channel logic. Then clients can either directly build on top of the SDK, or if they are thin clients, they can use the, the Peru node, which is uh, in some sense a wrapper around the SDK, which enables thin clients to work. And this is built by Bosch. And then in a separate repository, we have the smart contracts, which um, yeah, realize the smart contract logic that I just talked about. In more detail, how is the framework built and what component does the framework have? So at its core, as I said, there's the state channel logic and an important property is that we build it with modularity in mind. So we initially planned to have a framework which is usable with many types of blockchains, not just with Ethereum, but you can build your own blockchain adapter and through our abstract interface, you can integrate it easily without changing the application code. That's, uh, from my point of view, a main feature of, of, of our framework. And the same accounts for uh, the persistence. So you can plug in your favorite database adapter, you can plug in your favorite logging engine and your favorite message broker. So all of these things are not directly integrated into the framework. We give some examples, what we already provide, but you can also provide your own adapter. And, um, so this, we think, makes the framework usable, uh, hopefully, in many application scenarios. And now Manu from Bosch will tell you about how they use it in, in their application scenarios. Hi, all. Uh, so I will be presenting on uh, Perun node. So Perun node is a multi-user node that we are uh, building using the Perun SDK which provides the opportunity for uh, devices with less resources to use the Perun protocol and make state channel transactions. At the core, uh, we use the Perun SDK and initialize the different adapters required for it. So we use Ethereum adapter for blockchain and level DB for persistence and so on. And uh, on top of that, we add two other functionalities. So the first is key handling. And uh, the first thing we have implemented is like to use Ethereum key stores. And second is off-chain identity provider. So this off-chain entity provider is like, if you have an off-chain network and many participants in that, you need two things. One is an identity of the provider, which using which he will authenticate his uh, uh, ownership of that identity. Second is the communication address to reach him. So this is what uh, this module does. And uh, this complete adapters and identity providers are all encapsulated in a session so that uh, multiple users can use the same node. And to use the node, uh, we have a user API. And this API is uh, defined in an abstract way that uh, you can either use it as direct function calls or as a remote calls. So in the upcoming demo, I will show you uh, that using this API via remote call, a gRPC interface.
yeah so i'll present a demo so, here um Sorry, just because uh, Greg is having a question that I think is quite relevant to the previous slide. Uh, he, uh, he was asking if, uh, wh why are you using and if are you using level DB rather than couch DB? Yeah, I think uh, level DB was the first uh, implementation we are trying for uh, that fits the purposes. Uh, but maybe Sebastian can answer uh, more detail on Yeah, question. so we use, we have a very modular approach uh, using dependency injection by which you could use any um, database backend. And in particular, if you want to use CouchDB instead of LevelDB, we could basically within one or two days just provide a wrapper for this because we have like an abstraction using a key value store. And as far as I remember, CouchDB is also a key value store. So we can very quickly just integrate any key value store as uh, as the backend. So level DB is really just one example implementation of this, but um, yeah, we, we could integrate CouchDB within a matter of a few days. It's quite easy. And um, is it fair to say that parent blockchain is being used to just uh, settle and archive, uh, but the confirmation are done off confirmations are done off chain? Uh, yes, uh, so we set up, we block a particular amount on the blockchain and uh, within that amount, we can update our balances and make any number of transactions off chain, which does not require any on chain interaction. And only when we want to settle either like collaboratively or we have some dispute and we want to resolve it, only then we need to go to blockchain. Okay, so well, there, that there... makes sense, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a nice parallel that you can see here. So basically when you have a contract with someone, like a real life contract with a person, let's say you have a business um, um, uh, relationship with, with another business, you have a contract, right? It's a very complex contract, but of course you do the business with the other business person peer to peer, right? You don't go to a judge or to a court every time. You, you just do a normal business transaction. And this is exactly the way how we use the blockchain. So if you use the blockchain for every single transaction, that basically means you go to the court to do every single even uh, benign business um, transaction. And um, basically that's the, that's the metaphor here that we use the, um, that we use a blockchain only as a dispute handler, as a dispute uh, uh, re resolver. So it's a trust anchor, but normal transactions, if all involved parties behave honestly, can then be uh, done um, off chain. That's the idea. And how do you discover if uh, parties are behaving, uh, or how do you, how can you ensure that parties are behaving the right way? Um, so the idea is, uh, in in any in any kind of transaction, there's at least one party who would have a, um, like a negative outcome. If so, if one party tries to cheat another party, then that other party has a disadvantage, and then that other party can just go to the blockchain and dispute the state of the system. So it basically works like this. So every time you do transactions, you exchange cryptographic signatures and those signatures prove that uh, all parties agreed on some state of the system, on some state of a transaction. And if then one party tries to misbehave and not act according to the rules, then any other party can go to the blockchain and use it as a kind of judge to resolve the dispute. And, and that's basically one of the, the core idea here. And what uh, happens in case of uh, kind of coordinated malicious behavior? So, um, so the thing is, you you only can affect the involved parties. So if three PT, let's say three people are involved, then and all three people agree on some state, then it doesn't matter because they cannot hurt anyone else outside the system. Because you, right. for example, using channels, two parties deposit into a channel and then that channel only affects those two parties. So even if they both collude, they can only cheat themselves and not, and it doesn't have any other like effect on anything outside their channel, so to speak. So you have like a little encapsulated system. Yeah, right. I, would also, I would also like to point out that you can actually program this uh, resolution mechanism and what's a valid transaction on that channel. So we have an app concept on a channel level where you can program what is a valid transition for that channel and what is an image transition so you can even uh, uh, impose rules on what is okay or not not okay yeah. oh that's really cool um naman is asking how is dispute resolution handled in the case of uh iot scenario where we have multiple micropayments submitted from various devices throughout the network 
I mean, it's rather general. So for example, when you have IoT devices, you probably would use a node, like the node from Bosch, because you would then have like one, it's like an intermediate server service running, and then you have thousands of IoT devices. And you usually have, so what you usually experience in those systems is that you don't have so much malicious acting, but if that happens, of course, then the node would jump in and then resolve the dispute. So that means the node would send a transaction to the blockchain opening a dispute and then of course the party is the particular party involved in the dispute so for example the one party that was behaving um, dishonestly of course then at that point you cannot further transact but anyways i mean if a party is misbehaving then then you want to stop transacting with that party anyways so um, i don't know if that answered the question but i'm also very happy to to follow up if that wasn't clear yet. yeah we will also have a slide on the iot use case maybe um, could be clarified there, I don't know. Yeah, well, let's move to the demo. I'm sure that this will um, clarify some things and bring some other questions. All right. Yeah, sure. I, I can show one case in the demo where the other party is not willing to settle collaboratively and we can see how to settle. Yeah, so now I'll share my screen. So in the demo, I'll be presenting a split of the screen. So the first split will be uh, the blockchain node running. I'll be running Ganache CLI node. And in the second split, I'll be running a Perun node. And in the bottom two splits, I'll be running uh, two uh, client applications that we provide along with Perun node, but they are just reference implementations to interact with the Perun node. So now I'll present my screen. Uh, hope my screen is visible. Uh, so in this split, as I told, I will start a Ganache CLI node. And here I will start the Perun node. So before I start the Perun node, I was talking about the ID provider. And uh, for building the Perun node and generating the uh, default configuration files, you can have it uh, look at the readme files, but I can sh point you to one of the uh, configuration files that's here. Just a second. So you have the Perun node binary, and then you can generate the configuration files here. So if you generate the Alice, if you look at the Alice directory, there are four components. One is the database directory where the level DB database will go. And then there is an ID provider file. So if you look into the ID provider file, it actually tells uh, who Bob is, like what is his option address and uh, what is his communication address and how he can be connected, like via TCP uh, connection or whatever. So currently we are using a local implementation uh, where this comes from a file, but in future we are looking for integration with SSI network so that we can get this information from a larger uh, pool. So now I will start the Perun node here. And in the bottom two splits, I will start the Perun node CLI. So now we have started the Perun node CLI and for the first time we need to uh, use the contracts. We need to, the contracts to be deployed. But in real life case, I think there's only a single time instance of the contract deployed and hence this will not be done for like every uh, time you want to open a contract. So now the contract is deployed and we can check the balances of both the parties. So this is Alice balance, which is like 99 ethers. And this is Bob's balance, which is like 100 ethers. So now we will uh, connect to the node from this uh, terminal, both of these terminals, node connect. And we are here and we'll open a session for Bob in the split. And similarly, we will connect with the node and open a session for Alice here. So this session will initialize the ID provider and key store and everything else. So now we have that we can check if we are able to uh, get Bob's ID from this terminal. So yeah, we are able to get, so it tells the address. Now we can send a channel opening request to Bob. So channel send opening request to Bob and we can say the initial balance should be 10 for myself and 10 for Bob. So he gets a request here. So now we go there and accept the request. So if you look at the uh, blockchain terminal, we have a few transactions going on. So this is where the money is deposited on the blockchain. And now if we check the on-chain balances, 
it will be uh, decreased by 10 ethers for both of them. So this is Alice balance, which is like 89.9 something ethers. And this is Bob's balance, which is also like 89.9 something ethers. So now we are uh, free to send any number of transactions between these two parties. So I will try to send a transaction from this person and on this channel, and I will say send two ethers. So he gets a notification which he can accept. So he can also like request a transaction where his money is increased and others money is decreased. So that can also be accepted. So this way you can, you can either accept the transactions also reject them. If you reject them, then the channel states are not updated. So if you look at the uh, states after the channel update, you can see the update balance changes, but none of this is reflected on chain. So the on chain balances still remain the same. Now, if either of the parties feel that uh, they do not uh, want to transact anymore and want to close the channels, uh, they can send a close request. So if it is a collaborative close, what happens is that uh, a finalized state is sent to the other party, which he signs. And if both parties sign the state, then the finalized state is submitted to blockchain, then it's very fast resolution because both the parties agree. But in this case, I will show you where one of the parties is rejecting the finalized update. Still the first party is able to settle the channel on blockchain. So I will say channel close and settle on chain and the channel name. So if you look at here, he is getting another update which says, uh, should I accept the finalized state? I will reject it here. So though he is rejecting it, it will take a little more time because that uh, we should provide some time out for the parties uh, to uh, wait and provide some challenges. But after the time out, the channel automatically gets settled and the balances are withdrawn. So now we get an update that the channel is settled so we can check the on-chain balances. So now if you see the on-chain balances have changed that uh, Bob gets four ethers more because of some off-chain transactions. And yeah, that's the end of the demo. Next, uh, I think Daniel will present something more on uh, the IoT use case. Okay, I will share again. If we have questions on a demo, we can either have them now or we have another discussion slot after the next slide. Okay, so Daniel is next. Okay, thanks Manu for the, for the demo. Um, coming now to the industry-based showcase, I would like to point you to a public funded project located in Germany where we are participating, which is called Industrial Blockchain or iBlockchain. The goal of iBlockchain is to build an open and decentralized marketplace for the industry for the zero domain as a demonstrator, especially for the so-called order controlled production use case scenario, which is described by the platform Industry 4.0 Consortium. As a sample, for a better understanding, you can think of ordering and customizing a bicycle, which needs then to be manufactured and assembled by different suppliers based on the chosen parameters by the customer. Therefore, the described scenario wants to connect manufacturers and customers by using different market mechanisms like negotiations or auctions and other kinds of matchmaking, depending on the marketplace type. Next, please. Um, as outcome of the marketplace interaction, there will be an electronic agreement, which needs then to be set to be settled between the involved parties. Next, please. As part of this settlement, there is not only the manufacturing step included, but also some kind of payment between the involved parties. At this step, we want to bring in Perun to be able to make economic based transactions either between companies, organizations, or machines. Next, please. And this whole scenario will be built upon a common identity layer, which will be, which will be based on self-sovereign identity or SSI. And at the end, every involved in 
entity in this scenario needs an SSI based account for participa participation and interaction. For transactions, on the other hand, a common DLT will be then used. And now I would like to hand over to back to Sebastian for the next questions and discussions round. Yeah, thanks. So now that you have seen a little bit more how we can use this and possible applications of this, um, yeah, we just wanted to ask you in general, how relevant do you see this particular kind of solutions of scaling solutions um, for your projects, your business area? In the meantime, I'll just bring up uh, the question that uh, Manjiri uh, asked, which was what is the underlying protocol used for uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication? And I know, Sebastian, you answered it in Q&A, but I don't think that everybody's observing it. So I wanted to make sure that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to repeat that. Yeah. yeah so. So in general, um, the SDK doesn't make any expectations on how peer-to-peer -peer messages are transported because again, we use dependency injections so you can insert any communication mechanism that for example, already is in place. I mean, probably if you wanna insert this into some existing application, you already have your communication infrastructure, right? So maybe you use lib P2P or maybe you have encrypted TCP IP connections or maybe you have some other kind of message broker system and any, can, any kind of system can be used to then just transport our system, our messages. So basically, of course, you have to implement uh, some interface. So you basically have to provide a kind of thin wrapper around the, the communication system that you have. And then we can reuse your existing communication system to um, transport the peer-to-peer -peer messages that our um, framework our protocol needs. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I remind uh, uh, you all to uh, participate in the poll. We are really curious. What do you think about Perrin? And do you think it's something that you'd be using? Um, I still see uh, that there are people who are haven't voted. Um, currently, medium relevance is the one that is winning. So you get the chance to change the <laughs> change the vote. Use your power. Uh, oh, someone added high relevance. Okay, so between medium and high is what we are seeing right now. Um, so. Yeah, well, what do you think then? Do you think that, uh, um, are, are you happy with this result or uh, would you, uh, well, I guess you are, <laughs> you, you'd rather have it high than not. Um, how, how would it be relevant to other industries? So we talked about IoT, but how do you imagine using Perrin in, I don't know, supply chain or something else? So, so in general, um, so this particular technology that we present here channels are most relevant if you have recurring transactions between the same set of participants, uh, or at least if you have, or you can also have a like hub and spoke infrastructure. So basically you have, you can have like one hub in the middle and then you have thousands of, of uh, other devices or people connected to that hub. So this is in general the, the kind of um, application usage scenario where this makes sense. So for example, in supply chain, you sometimes have the situation that of course, basically when you update the system state, for example, you use a fabric system, a hyperledger fabric, and then you, you want to pu publish some system update state, then of course it should be visible to the whole world, so to speak, right? Because you use the ledger as a means of single source of truth for the whole world. And in this particular kind of applications, um, going off chain is, is not really um, helping because of course you want the, the changes to the system to be publicly visible to the whole world, so to speak, to the whole mm -hmm. system. Um, yeah, but basically anything that involves not only payments, but also more complex transactions between a fixed set of participants. 
but you could also realize an intermediate solution like a hybrid solution where you have some off chain updates and only at certain intermediate points you have global on chain uh, on chain visibility for your supply chain or something like this. Yeah. So that might be also a use case where you, where you can still use channels. I would be interested uh, from those people who rated medium or low. What? Uh, yeah. What? Uh, why? They, why is it a little bit relevant? But could we extend the framework maybe to make it more relevant? Or what are their uh, main uh, challenges or main interests in that area? So if somebody would like to comment, I would be curious to hear. Yeah, Oliver, you mentioned that you use um, kind of tokens and um, to transact or exchange tokens. So what do you think about um, about Perrin? Do you have an idea how you would use it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I myself uh, already worked with it, but um, I didn't, I, I'm not uh, doing any kind of business with, uh, with Ethereum professionally. It's just for private use. So I would be on the consumer side so i would need someone else to like create a platform that then can be um integrated with, with metamask yeah. that, that people just use i would also like to hear from somebody else and then ollie because he's part of our team so oh so, right <laughs> sorry <laughs> but I, I i would be really interested in to hearing the the opinion of, of people that i don't know already so uh, Naman, you you were asking about uh, uh, dispute resolution uh, and um, yeah, uh, IoT with micropayments. Is this something that you're working with? Hi, hi. Uh, yes, I am working uh, at this particular use cases wherein we require lot of transactions amongst two devices, basically hardware devices and because those are the micropayments, uh, which is why I was looking at Perun and I have been following it since almost six to eight months. But I really wanted to know the dispute logic and uh, glad that I could get it from you. Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate here, so it, it really depends on the on the on the whole system setup you so either each device itself can run the dispute in case of of a dispute but of course in a in in like some industrial application or it sounds like in your application it probably makes more sense that you have like a node a server running for mm -hmm. you that is handling all the disputes so that the all the thousands of devices don't really need to handle this so they don't need to watch the blockchain and so on. So basically you have like all those end devices who would be doing the transactions, microtransactions, but then you have like this node who's doing this um, channel watching. So okay. I mean, yeah. So watching the blockchain is just, a, it's a general necessity in all uh, second layer solutions. So anytime you go off chain, so there are also other solutions like Plasma, like Rollups, like Erdstahl, which is another project that we launched for the ETH online hackathon last year. Uh, mm -hmm. And all those solutions, you always have um, chain watching. It's like a fundamental problem because, of course, anyone else could try to cheat you by running a dispute on an old state of the system on chain. And this is why there's like this fundamental um, um, property of off chain protocols that you always need to watch the chain. One thing, yeah, one thing which I would also like here to be addressed is uh, when I was looking at the demo. Uh, one thing which we can also focus on is how to address the confidentiality of the data there. Because uh, as far as I saw in the demo when two nodes were interacting, we can see that the addresses were been issued. So if we have some encoding or encryption there to ensure that the data or whatever transactions are happening uh, remains uh, confidential, not only to the parties, but also when they are uh, stored finally appended to the ledger as well. So that thing can also be taken care. Uh, so you, you basically only see the, the, um, the batch of the transaction. So basically the, the aggregated effect of all the transactions would be visible on chain, right? So you could run thousands of transactions off chain and this would never be visible on the blockchain, but only the final state. So say you open a channel and both parties put in a hundred and then, I don't know, at the end, you have a channel where the balance is 50 and 150. 
uh, and then only this final balance would be visible on chain of course because people withdraw their funds back on chain but how you came to that um, final balance is not visible so the privacy of the intermediate steps so to speak is preserved here okay okay thank you thank you so much yep. you're welcome Any other comments or questions? Well, I guess we can move on then. All right, then I'll take over. So my name is Chris, um, and I'd like to shift the focus in this final part of today's session um, to the from the technology um, to parents' journey from academic research um, to the, our current open source project. Uh, you may wonder why Bosch got engaged in this Perron development quite early. So in a way, it was coincidence of need. As you heard, in our, even in our early prototypes with Ethereum, we ran into those scalability issues and opportunity as state channels were invented around that time um, when we had those problems. And we've been in contact with um, Professor Faust and his colleagues since the early stages of their research. Um, and based on those, and if you click, we see a point in time on the timeline. Um, based on those results and the early walkthrough prototypes and smart contracts that were already created within the um, at the TU Darmstadt, um, within our research project economy of things, we started to implement a first version of this state channel node application. And this was always meant to be open source. Um, and I think it may be interesting to quickly recap um, what our, why, the, why we think it, it, that is so and what the initial open source strategy was. And that would be the next slide. Um, so we are a potential user of the technology and not a technology provider per se, actually. But our overall goal for Perun is that we want to have um, enabled scalability of blockchain payments and smart contracts and without any gatekeepers, or it shouldn't be monopolizable infrastructure in the end, um, to enable um, high volume of arbitrary transactions, including scalable micropayments that support our vision of an economy of things. And if you go to the next thing, um, Perun, as, it is, as we learned as a protocol at heart, um, we think it needs widespread adoption to function. And so the main open source goal is to lead a standardization effort to establish it as a major part in the payments and smart contracts ecosystem. And a second um, very important benefit of an open source approach, as you'll know, is that open source provides a framework for partner collaboration. And we'll see that in a minute. And additionally, for a product like Perun, um, obviously transparency and open access to the development process many of you as a required part of getting trust and the resulting protocols and implementations and stuff. Um, next, please. Um, oops, yeah, there's a link on the left-hand <laughs> side, <link>. sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point you to an interesting article by Carl Vogel and James Vassil from Open Tech Strategists, which they published together with Mozilla, which um, helps to guide strategic thinking about the question how to set up such projects. Um, and they talk about open source archetypes, which are just open source project patterns. And here the most fitting archetype for Peron is, I think, a multi-vendor infrastructure archetype, which is exactly designed for non-monopolizable infrastructure projects. And you know many of the well-known projects like Kubernetes, OpenStack, or Hyperledger itself. Um, are some well-known examples. Now to the next slide, we continue. Um, now that you know where we want to go, <laughs> we continue our journey. So we were at the point where we had started with an initial in-house implementation. And the major obstacles around that time and until the first open source release, uh, which you already saw up here, <laughs> were a lack of speed and uh, ensuing friction in collaboration. So we had different internal repos, different communication channels, et cetera. And you may have experienced similar things. And ultimately this led to two independent implementations being open sourced in the end of 2019, so more than a year ago. We 
at a state channel node and the first version of the Prune SDK. However, the first very positive effect of going open source, so finally going open source, um, was that it made collaboration just so much easier. Um, and it enabled contributions. And so at the beginning of 2020, um, our two teams had gotten together. We had regular tech calls, we had a common chat system, and we started to have some see some contributions to either code base. Um, and and if you, I think if you continue, then we see that um, also we rebuilt the node on top of the SDK, so it started to evolve into this modular framework we presented today. And I think the next important step was to move to a neutral home um, to further evolve this project. Uh, and we're happy to have found that at Hyperledger Labs. And I'd like to use the opportunity here to thank Arno, who was our sponsor, and Ryan Tracy, who as lab stewards helped us to get the infrastructure going. And not to forget Marta, who's our host here, who helped to get this rolling to start with. Um, and with the founding of Polycrypt, um, we also see the start of a hopefully growing um, multi-vendor infrastructure ecosystem um, around this technology. So to sum up on the next slide, um, Perun is a modular framework for building scalable blockchain applications. At its core is the SDK. Um, and as for the next steps, um, plan to invest some time and documentation to ease onboarding of new developers. We also foresee additional blockchain backends. And I mean, there's many DLTs in the Hyperledger space, and maybe there's some interest in by, um, users. And I guess which ones get implemented depends on, on user needs. And it, we would also welcome contributions, of course, if you're interested to get involved here. Um, we're also looking forward to virtual channels to support to some of the, 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 the the features we haven't spoken into detail yet, but that would enable this hop and spoke architecture, I think, um, and could even build um, or enable cross-chain transactions, uh, Matthias mentioned earlier. Um, so you could do an off-chain transaction sending one ether and your Perun state channel peer receives a different coin of equal or comparable value on a fabric network, say. Um, anything you'd like to add, um, Sebastian or Matthias? Sounds good. Okay, as far as the node is concerned, I mean, we are we're interested in this IoT use case. So we are, we are looking to develop a light node or a library for embedded devices um, to use in, in, those, uh, in that showcase project um, Daniel presented earlier. Um, and last but not least, and at least in my view, I think the biggest challenge at this point in time um, this year is to grow this open source project. And so we'd love you to get in touch and start to collaborate. Um, whether you just want to use Perun or think you've got an interesting use case, or even even better if you want to start to contribute and integrate it with other hyperledger technologies, for example. Because today, uh, the current implementation works with Ethereum, um, but as you saw, the abstractions are in place to add other DLTs. Today, we have a simple off-chain identity provider, but I think integration with SSI would also be a valuable addition. Or maybe you have other great ideas. Then um, either so wish them now uh, or later. <laughs> uh, Mark is actually asking uh, or says that it would be interesting if you could uh, discuss the pros and cons of using general purpose blockchain with Perum versus a special purpose blockchain like uh, Iroha, Hyperledger Iroha for IoT. Um, yeah, I, I have a few words to say about this, maybe also Sebastian or others. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, I think one interesting uh, property of our framework is that it's flexible. Um, you can create off-chain networks dynamically. You don't have to predetermine who can talk to whom. You can go off-chain, interact very efficiently and go on-chain again and create a new group. Or you can even transact between different uh, different blockchains using that state uh, that that channel technology. And I think this is something I'm not totally familiar with all the existing projects, honestly. Um, but I think this is something that I haven't seen like like it in, in the other projects. 
Yeah, I think it really depends on the context. So for example, if you want to set up some IoT systems that eventually transact on the public Ethereum blockchain, then of course you kind of need something like Perun or some other framework for going off chain. Um, but if you say, okay, I'm setting up a system, but it's a closed system. So it's like a private blockchain. And I really know that this is exactly the kind of use case. And then I don't know, I, if Iroha perfectly covers this use case, then I would, I would suggest, okay, then better use the special purpose um, software because it's made for this particular use case. So in general, yeah, I would say if, if some special purpose uh, blockchain or, or solution like Iroha um, supports, uh, like fits your bill perfectly, then I would just use it. Because of course, using um, a framework on top of Ethereum adds complexity. Um, but then on the other hand, this also opens up all those possibilities that you can interact with the Ethereum blockchain, but still be efficient off chain. I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, uh, Manjiri also is asking if you could elaborate on the light node implementation. How would it be different than existing light no client implementation? Um, maybe Manu or someone from yeah, Rush I wants to answer I can that. Explain it here. Uh, so, what the, the current node that we have, uh, per se, the Perun node has all functionalities like it can set up blockchain. It can help you to do off-chain off transactions and it can settle. But if you look at IoT use cases, maybe they do not have uh, the access to the funds because the uh, wallets need more security and cannot be stored on embedded devices. So they can request for uh, the owner of the IoT device some gateway to set up the state channel and they can have components only for making off-chain transactions. And the uh, setting of the state channel and closing can be taken care of by the uh, uh, gateway and for uh, like off-chain transactions, they can completely do independent of the gateway itself. So that is one of the uh, directions that we are looking for light nodes where we have a minimal possible functionality on the embedded device to do off-chain transactions. Uh, does that uh, help you? Uh... I, I hope it does. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, I think that this is all we have time for. Uh, so I would like to really thank you for joining us here today.